Um, so in the past couple, couple of days, we heard about um, computational approaches and statistical methods to process brain data. And this talk is quite different. I'm going to be talking about how the brain might implement some um, computational processes and what happens in the brain when, when it thinks about statistics. So in this um, presentation, hopefully I will, by the end of it, I'll convince you that the brain is able to learn about statistical properties in sensory environment, and uh, it can do so even when it is engaged in the very demanding task which uh, um, demands a lot of attentional resources. So uh, a few words about predictive coding, and we'll hear more about it uh, later today uh, from Michael. Um, so predictive coding really thinks about the brain as a predictive machine. Um, and so it really says that uh, what we perceive from the world is a combination between what we expect to happen and what actually is happening. So it, it is uh, uh, really comparing these, um, these two sources of information. Um, and so um, it turns out that the brain is really good at um, detecting uh, prediction violations. So um, I just want to give an analogy uh, to when we go to a concert um, and we uh, might know a piece by heart and so we know what follows, um, which note follows uh, the other note. But if the musician makes a mistake, um, the brain is really good at detecting this, right? Not only is it very disappointing, but it turns out that uh, there is a huge uh, brain response to these uh, prediction violations. Um, so we can call these prediction errors, and there's all sorts of um, prediction errors uh, in the brain. I'll, I'll be focusing more on the, on the sensory, but there's uh, a great deal of work uh, looking at reward uh, prediction errors in reinforcement, in reinforcement learning. Um, so in sensory uh, processing, um, and especially in, in, in auditory um, um, studies, a uh, hallmark of testing these ideas of prediction um, is, um, um, is, is the, the use of um, auditory oddball paradigms. And this is just an example, uh, perhaps the simplest example of an oddball paradigm where we have um, a sequence of sounds uh, that, are, um, that have a given frequency, and then once in a while we'll have sounds that deviate from this frequency. So these are called uh, deviant uh, sounds or oddballs. Uh, so um, when we measure uh, the e event-related uh, responses to these standard sounds and deviant sounds, uh, we can see we're using EEG uh, or MEG um, waveforms which look like this. So you see um, the evoked response to standards in blue and um, the evoked responses to deviants in green. And when we uh, perform a difference between these two, uh, we've got uh, the so-called mismatch negativity or um, a prediction error, uh, sensory prediction error response. Um, so we can think about this classic oddball paradigm as uh, sampling um, standards and deviants from two delta um, functions. Um, so, but what we asked here uh, in this study was, what if uh, what is standard or normal actually is a bit more variable than just a given frequency? So what if we sample our standards from a Gaussian distribution? Uh, and, and then if we compare these, um, oops, sorry. And if we, we still sample our oddballs or uh, deviants from this other delta function, um, can we still um, see prediction error responses uh, such, uh, such as the mismatch negativity. And, um, and indeed, when we, comp when we measure uh, with MEG and compare sounds that, are, uh, that coincide with the mean of this Gaussian and sounds that, that are uh, in the tails of this distribution, we see a, a, a prediction error response. And I, here I'm, I'm showing you um, the results of, the, uh, of uh, the, the study we did with um, magnetoencephalography when I was um, at UCL. And we see that these prediction errors uh, are distributed um, over a network 
uh, of areas including secondary auditory cortex and uh, infraparietal cortex. So uh, here I have the, the paradigm, uh, perhaps it's slightly too small, <laughs> sorry about that, uh, but this is a, a, a description of the paradigm uh, which we used. So you see um, in blue shading the, the Gaussian distribution, um, um, which is uh, narrow uh, as compared to uh, the, the Gaussian distribution in red, which is slightly broader. Okay, so both of these Gaussians are centered at the same frequency, and we have standards being sampled uh, from these two Gaussians. Um, in one block, we have uh, sounds sampled from the narrow Gaussian, and, and in the second block, we have sounds sampled from the broad uh, Gaussian. Um, and, and then importantly, our outliers are still um, are, uh, are outside this distribution on, on, the, uh, on, on the first block, uh, but are exactly the same, um, physically exactly the same uh, in, the, in the first and the second block. So um, our, our question was whether we can um, evoke prediction errors when we compare outliers and, and uh, means, but also can we, if we compare these two uh, outliers which are identical, can we find a higher prediction error uh, when we have a narrow context? So, um, uh, and our prediction is that, yes, these, these sounds should be more surprising and a, a narrow um, context than and they're abroad. So we did, uh, we did this experiment in the PLOS CB paper uh, in 2013, um, and then, um, what we, 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 we did uh, afterwards was, was to ask, what if we uh, have people uh, be engaged in, the, in a demanding task which requires attentional resources, such as the NBAC task? And I have a, a, a schematic here of, of the NBAC task. So basically, we have a stream of letters being um, appearing in the screen, and people are asked to um, detect um, um, repetitions of, of a letter. Um, one after the other, and, and this is the one back task. And then in the uh, two back task, people will have to detect repetitions um, of one letter uh, before. So uh, you have here two T's um, separated by uh, uh, another uh, letter. So, uh, so really here we have um, a two by two by two design. So we've got um, means and outliers in the context of a narrow and uh, a broad distribution, and uh, while people are uh, performing a, either low load task or a high load task. So um, what, what we did here was to um, measure with EG this time, not with MEG. So uh, we actually first tried to replicate our MEG experiment uh, using just um, this um, statistical learning paradigm without the uh, end back task. Uh, so we just had like a very simple uh, detection task. And, uh, and yes, indeed, we, we did replicate our results. Um, and, and so as, as, uh, as predicted, we see that uh, both outliers in red and blue uh, evoke uh, a larger response um, um, around the mismatch negativity um, time, which is between 100 and 200, uh, 250 milliseconds. And we see that uh, responses to the means uh, sort of go together uh, a lot s smaller than responses to outliers. Now, what happens when we have people engaged in, in a demanding task? Uh, that's over here. So this is for the low load task or the um, N1 task. And again, we don't see much difference, right? So people are still able to detect outliers, and, um, and there is a higher prediction error uh, in the context of a narrow distribution, uh, as you see in blue. But what if people are engaging in an even more demanding task, um, such as the um, two-back? Um, 
and I have to confess that we did uh, hope for a, a modulation of, of cognitive load uh, or cognitive demands, but we didn't actually find any. So uh, that's the bad news. The, the good news is that actually uh, the brain is still able to learn this statistical um, structure in the environment, even if it is uh, engaged on a very demanding task, and I can tell you that a two-back is quite, quite a hard task to do. Um, so, just want to show you now uh, some, um, so I showed you, sorry, here I should say this is just one channel around uh, frontal central electrode, which is typically um, presented in um, mismatch negativity studies, but really with EEG we, we can see the whole uh, coverage uh, of the scalp. And so uh, what I show you here is a video of uh, the statistical map. So if you are familiar with um, SPMs, uh, statistical parametric uh, maps for um, fMRI, uh, this is the same, uh, but now for this EEG data and the statistical map is across uh, um, space and time. And so, how do I get this back on? Oh, it's still going, sorry. <laughs> so there's nothing significant uh, later on. So all the significance is um, early at, um, from about 70 milliseconds um, over 150. So this really shows uh, what we call the surprise effect. So this is the main effect um, of surprise, uh, where outlier responses show a, a greater response as compared to uh, means. Uh, and, and I'm showing you just the, the, the statistics, uh, a corrected um, for the whole uh, volume of comparisons. Then, uh, here, I'll, I'll show you the interaction between um, surprise and variance. So this is really asking the question, where in space and time um, are uh, outliers bigger than the means in the context of the narrow as compared to the broad distribution? So in the previous, the previous video um, shows that the brain is sensitive to outliers, and this one shows that the brain is sensitive to to the, to the variance of, um, of a statistical distribution. Um, okay, so the next one, um, so, sorry, I, I should say, so the, these two first um, are, um, videos are, uh, are, are for the d detection task, so it, there's not, there wasn't any heavy um, working memory load. Um, now for, when we make people perform this uh, uh, difficult task, uh, what we see. So this video shows um, an effect of surprise across the variance and load conditions. So this is regardless of variance and loads, putting every, collapsing all, all of the data together. So um, yes, we still see an effect of surprise, that's nice. We have uh, not only the very early effects, but also uh, later effects, which might perhaps be related to P300. Um, uh, but who knows whether we would have had in the, pr in the previous um, experiment if we had more trials. So th this one has, um, this experiment has more trials. Um, and, and then here is the, effect of uh, surprise and variance interaction uh, now um, across load conditions, so uh, high and low. Um, I don't have a video for the, uh, to separate the two um, load conditions, but um, I can show you here in this figure. Um, and basically, they show very, very similar results, and again, there was no difference between uh, um, a, a low and, and high load. Um, so here, this really summarizes uh, the, um, the previous uh, videos uh, now for all of the different conditions. So just bear with me, it's sort of a heavy slide. Um, so here we have effects of surprise. Here we have interaction um, between surprise and variance. And again, these are statistical maps. Um, the X, uh, the, the, the Z axis is time. And, um, and these uh, two panels correspond to cuts um, in, the, in the scalp, so you can think about it as those uh, videos that I showed you put, all put together, um, piled up, and uh, 
and here I'm just showing you a, a cut on one of the, the, the time points. Um, so we see very early clusters for surprise effects uh, when we have a very simple detection task. Um, when we have a demanding um, task such as um, the, the NBAC task, we see we still see uh, an effect of surprise and as well uh, interaction surprise variance. And then when we split the data between the uh, low and high load conditions, we still see um, effects of surprise and uh, surprise variance interaction. Okay, so uh, that brings me towards the end. I think I might have been a bit too quick. Um, so. What does this mean? So I've, I've showed you that outliers evoke larger prediction error responses than um, sounds in, in um, uh, centered at the mean of a distribution. Um, and so this really shows that the brain is sensitive to outlier detection. Um, I also show that there is a greater prediction error in the narrow than, the, than in the broad um, distribution. So um, this really might, uh, indicate that the brain is uh, sensitive to the likelihood of an event given um, the context that it is uh, in. Um, and so, um, and so we, we think that this uh, so-called mismatch negativity response or prediction error might be um, early mark that the brain is uh, able to learn a statistical structure in the environment. And, and finally, um, by doing this manipulation of attentional resources, we, uh, we see that, uh, well, it's not um, modulated, uh, or at least we don't find an effect of, uh, of this modulation, but uh, importantly, people can still uh, learn these statistical regularities uh, even when they, their uh, attentional resources are uh, being taken up uh, uh, by a different task. All right, so I would like to uh, end by uh, thanking uh, to James Ting, especially, He's, uh, he was an honors student last year with uh, myself and Jason Mattingly, and he did um, most of the, the hard work. Um, and uh, Jeremy Taylor, he's a, a great undergraduate student volunteering to, to in, in my lab, and he's, he's helped with uh, making these nice uh, videos. Um, and obviously Jason uh, Martingley. Um, also want to thank the um, ARC for, for the funding and, and, and Gary for inviting me and, um, and, um, and also for, uh, CIBF uh, for sponsoring this event. Thank you. Thanks for a nice talk. Um, so from the videos, it looked like the surprise effect was lateralized. And I wasn't yes. sure which way the orientation of the, the image was, but was, it, was there a sort of right parietal effect um, there? Yeah, I guess a little bit, bit more to the right, yeah. Um, it's not too obvious, um, but to, to really answer Precisely, I would have to make the statistical comparison uh, left, right. But um, mis in mismatch negativity studies, uh, there is uh, evidence for um, more activity on the right than on the left, and that seems to be um, uh, consistent. Although, I if, uh, um, if the, the prediction error is done in situations of language, uh, so where there's phonemes that are uh, violated, then we see more effect on, on the left. But yeah, I haven't really explored that statistically. Thanks, Marta. Uh, what was your error rate on the, uh, the one and the two back tasks? And mm. are your results affected by performance on the letter task in any way? Mm. Uh, that's a good question. I, I didn't correlate um, the behavior responses with the with the, the EG. I could do that, um, but the error rates—they, 
I mean, they were pretty good. We, we eliminated people that uh, were b below chance on, uh, uh, on any of the tasks, so they were around 70%, so we tried to make it, uh, well, obviously not at ceiling, but not, not too hard. Yeah, but it would, be, it would be nice to correlate the behavior with uh, electrophysiology, definitely. Thanks for the talk, that was great. Um, I was trying to think of it more like uh, generally speaking, when you're studying these other things, there's a, a lot of people that are doing similar-ish paradigm, right? Uh, I, mean, sort of, I mean, this is classical paradigm, and, uh, and I was thinking, so how could you uh, grab all the results of those other paradigms and, and think of how you integrate those results in a, a, sort of a, a model that can uh, sort of explain those things uh, in, and s still keeping like you know a kind of a small area of you know, this is you know uh, uh, the specific paradigm and, uh, and, and the specificities of the paradigm but still construct a model that can explain many of the resources that are in the same area I mean uh, it's kind of a general question and I'm, I'm sorry that it's not like a, yeah. but, uh, but it seems to me that there's uh, a real need to sort of uh, start to integrate mm -hmm. uh, results that yeah. are close by and, uh, and at the moment, uh, basically, the results are in papers, and uh, what you kind of integrate and to build something in your mind, you just have to read the papers, and the model is in your mind. But how do you think, it, I mean, is there a way yeah. that you can see that we could formalize that and make yeah. it same again? Yeah, so I think predictive coding is, is the answer, is really the, the theory that is, explains this, uh, this phenomena. So um, in all of these, um, mismatch negativity studies and oddball paradigms or any uh, and, and even beyond so when we have a, a rule and this rule is violated uh, we always see prediction error and, and I think that that just shows how um, the brain is really really interested in making models of the world uh, and making predictions about what will happen next and anything that um, mismatches or, or violates uh, our prediction is really very salient and we can think about um, you know, theories of um, 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 adaptive the theory. So if there's something surprising in the event, uh, in the environment, uh, well, that might indicate uh, a, a potential danger or a potential reward. So um, being, being able to uh, predict what will happen next can give us a, a competitive advantage for um, going after that re reward and, and getting it quicker uh, or uh, avoiding some, uh, um, some uh, some threat, some um, dangerous situation in the environment. So um, yeah, mm -hmm. I think predictive coding is the so, answer. So yeah. basically, a, mo a model like that would explain results of those, like uh, five, ten papers that uh, you've seen in the and uh, and you know just this model would be the result of the uh, of those kind of five, ten papers. Like, uh, I I believe so. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Yeah. Okay, thank you.